I'm Sandy Strader, and as you said, I participated in the festival, and it's something I enjoy to do, and then a Civil War, for some reason, I really am attracted to doing Civil War fabrics and quilts, and I don't know if it's because my, actually, my great-grandfather was in the Civil War, um, so that's not really that far, that many generations ago where my, grand, my great-grandfather was in it, so um, I, maybe that's why I lean towards it, I don't know, maybe it's the fabrics. Um, but it's something I like to do. And so um, I'm going to talk a little about the period and the, um, how they got their colors and <coughs> the patterns, how they got their names, the different blocks and things. And again, if you have any questions at the end, I'd be happy to answer them as, many, as good as I can. And, and excuse me being a little nervous, it's for, once I get going, I'll calm down a little on that. So, um, but the, a lot of people don't realize, even though the South had um, grew most of the cotton, that the Northern still was able to get cotton. So they could still make quilts and that. So that wasn't a big issue for them. And um, they didn't buy from the South because they didn't want to fill their coffers with, our, with the Northern money and that. Although I did find on the web, website, I don't know how true it was, or um, that during this time that... Um, Abraham Lincoln that they actually made a trade agreement with the South on some items that they would trade back and forth and that um, so there is um, a thing about that um, trader or traders or traders um, northern cotton trading <coughs> during the Civil War so I printed that out and if you're interested you can look through it and find the website you know I'm happy to help you um, um, most of the fabric was hand dyed using um, plants. They had um, what they called matter, and that made the browns, um, the dark browns. Um, and actually, I can't find my dark brown. <laughs> but it made um, the dark browns. And depending on what they added to it, it could change the color also. And that. So this is like an example of the, the what they would get from the matter plant. And that. Um, well, first let me go back to um, the wool and cotton was um, their most the uh, most used fabric that we had in, during this time, and um, they would use it for uniforms. The wool, except when it started getting hot, then they would switch over to the cotton. And they also had um, blue jean fabric. And so in the summertime, they would make, switch the jeans, their wool, into their, into their blue jeans and that because it was a lighter weight. And um, they actually made how we got the blue jeans blue was there's a dye called indigo. And um, indigo hasn't changed since the beginning. It's still dyed in vats. And they do it over in Africa and Europe, mostly Africa. Um, they still do it the same way they did back then. That's why if you try to buy true indigo, it costs a lot more money because of the dyeing process. And very seldom in America do we do any dyeing anymore because the EPA regulations, um, they kind of put the dyeing cotton business out of, or cotton out of business because of the <coughs> EPA regulations because of the pollutants and stuff. But they did um, use the cotton and the wool um, they also had um, wool blends and, you know, wool and cotton blend, and they would use those for, you know, other quilts. And they all, the southern women had what they called um, the Lindsay Woolsey and the homespun. And they, they really liked this because they <coughs> figured they would make, spin their own, so it was called homespun. And they would make their own clothes, and this way they didn't buy from the Yankees. So they were they were supporting their <coughs> southern roots in that. So they would do that. And then there was also they still had we had silk and um, and linen, but those were very expensive. So they would just use those on special occasions because you had a. It was just so hard to take care of them. Um, the linen was wrinkled very easily, so you, you had to use high heat to um, to iron it. So it was just only used for special occasions, occasions just for that reason. Um, so they mostly just stuck with the um, cottons and the wool. 
Um, okay, it talked about the matter, and there's actually a plant called the matter plant, and they would use its roots for the um, to get the browns and that. And it would change it depending on what they added. They could add tin or um, almond, and that would change the colors depending on what they added to it. Um, they also call, have made what they call double cinnamon or pink, double pink, and they call it cinnamon. And um, this was popular in that time, and it was also often used in pinks and browns. And I actually have a pink and brown quilt here. And so there's this, all the different color pinks and browns that they would have had during this time period. Because again, all these fabrics are just reproductions of what they actually had. So these are all colors, and you're, afterwards you can come up and look at everything. And feel free to touch. You know, they're all been well loved, so <laughs> you can't hurt them. My dog's actually chewed a hole in this one. But um, so this is different colors that they would use, different pinks and, and the browns, also the matter colors and that. And then they also used, um, they had um, a turkey red, which is just like a, it would have been solid, but it would have been a dark red. And then most of the time it was um, used with solid greens or other things like, or other colors like that. Um, and then they also had orange, which, and I have to say, a lot of people, when they see this fabric, when I tell them, you know, they're, this, they go, what fabric's that? Because I actually work at a quilt shop. And I say, well, that's Civil War. And they go, they can't believe that the colors were this vivid and bright. Um, but they were. You know, we all look at the pictures and they're all black and white, so we don't see their colors. So this is some of the orange colors that, our orange prints that they had. And they would, um, a lot of women would dye their own. Um, this is also called cheddar. So that's because it looks like cheddar cheese. So um, it's also called chrome orange. And they would um, get the chemicals to dye it from the druggist. So they could go to the drugstore and say, I need this chemical to dye it. And so you could get it off the counter, over the counter, which I'm sure you can't do that right now anymore. So, um, and chromate was um, the main dye that they used, but it was very toxic. And, um, because it contained lead as one of its main element, main ingredients. So we all know lead's not, wasn't good, so. And orange was most common in Pennsylvania and especially in applique quilts. They used a lot of it in the applique quilts. Um, during this time period, the applique kind of went by the wayside and the, um, the whole cloth and um, there was one more, I forgot. Um, and they went to piecing because as they were traveling west, you could, you could piece as you're walking or riding in the wagon where you can't work on the applique that well while you're walking because you're dragging a whole quilt. So that's when the piecing really came into an effect. Um, I already told you about the indigo. They also had purples and greens. And here's an example of the purple. And then here's an example of the green. And as you look at this green, it's sort of yellowish. Well, they have what they call it was over dye. And they, in order to get the color, they would dip it in. Um, it would start out as one color. It's like they would do blue, dip it in, you know, dye it blue, and then dye it uh, yellow. And then they would get this color in order to get their green. So they called it over dye because they were actually using two dyes for it. And then also um, on the purple, sometimes they were fugitive. What they, and what fugitive was is like after a time, after a long period of time, the purple would fade into brown. So if you actually see a real a, a quilt from the 1800s, which there still are plenty of them out there, and there there'll be a um, brown. Um, brown spot in the block, you know, brown piece of fabric, it may have actually been purple. And that it'll sort of, sort of look streaky, and if it's kind of like that, then you know it was probably purple to begin with, and it's just faded over the years. Um, the different patterns that they had <coughs> were um, stripes. They had a lot of striped fabric. Here's one example. 
and I try to bring a lot of different fabrics. Um, here's another striped fabric that they would have had. Here's another purple with stripes. They also had paisley. So here is an example of their paisley that they would have had. And then they had shirting, which is um, what the men would use. Uh, they would use for like on their men's shirts and that. So they, it would be white with different colors. And we have white with the pink. And then white with like black and red. And black and yellow. And just the mix of red and black and a beige background. And here's a, a blue stripe. And then we have the brown. A lot of these, like nowadays, we use these like for borders. <coughs> nice borders. And they would do, they were very political back during that time. And so that came out with um, different. Um, political, patriotic. So this is one of them that they came out with. And these were always a little bigger and spaced out differently. Um, they also ha would have faces of like the president <coughs> or other um, people. They would have anchors, um, little dogs and cats, which up here somewhere there's, I have a little cat fabric, oh, here it is. And little cats um, drinking tea out of a teacup. And that. So, again, just little cute things, and you go, oh, you would think that they'd have these kind of things back then, but they did have them. Um, they also had, um, they had geometric. And this one, like, just like a, a green with brown in it, stripes. And then here's a round one, just circles, excuse me just circles. And here's another one that they would have used for the patriotic, just uh, stars, blue with the star. And again, this is like the indigo color here. <coughs> and this one still is like a geometric with like um, hexagons and stars. And yeah. So here's another um, <coughs> paisley one. If you can't see the back, tell me, yell at me so I can raise it up higher if I'm not. Um, and a lot of times they would make them look like text, different textures, which I don't have an example, but like the background would look like lace in the background and that. So um, so they had different texture looking on them. Um, some would be ribbons, ruffles. Um, so they would do that just to give it a little um, movement to it. Um, and the fabrics during this time period also weren't limited to the cottons and the wools. They did have um, silks and brocades also, but again, those weren't used as often in the, the quilts. They didn't use those. They did eventually in the 1900s start doing the cr crazy quilts, and then they did bring the velvet, satins, and silks into them. Um, Um, the, again, during this time period, when they started doing the geometric, cutting their pieces out, as they, because again, they could walk and, and piece. Um, one of the easiest ones to learn is the nine path. So it's a, just a simple nine patch that they would they could do. And again, you know, they could just sew this as they're walking, not a big problem. Um, This one is Ohio Star. And that, so. Um, and the kids, the little girls weren't left out either because when they were little, they were old enough to hold a needle, they started learning how to quilt little, little doll blankets. And that, so these are just some of the examples of little doll blankets that I brought, because back then, every girl knew how to sew. 
Although I tell my husband nowadays, he better buy a new shirt before I sew a button on because I don't do buttons. <laughs> I quilt, I don't do buttons anymore. So um, They used to make a lot of album quilts and then people would sign them and when fr their friends would move, they know they would probably never see them again so they would send them with the album quilt with their love and um, a lot of the families would do that also. Um, a lot of the times they would um, <coughs> make their um, quilts and they would do the um, setting block which is on here it's the um let me find this block right here is next to every block this one right here mm -hmm. and so that's sort of like the setting block on this one um, some of them they didn't do that like this one here is um, two different blocks just right next to each other and that, so they just put them right next to each other. Yeah. Um, some they put on point, which I don't have any of those, um, so I didn't, I wasn't able to bring any of those. Um, the the most popular ones during this time period became like the blue and white and the red and white. Those were very popular during this time period. Um, and um, the sewing machine actually came out during the civil, right before the Civil War. Um, one sewing machine went for $55. The Singer sewing machine, it, it was said it was $25, but you could make payments on it because only the rich really could afford $25 at a time. But there were a lot of women that did have the machines, and they actually did <coughs> machine quilt. They machine piece, but they actually did machine quilting on it also. Um, they would do what they call just like um, one single row around you know, round something like an echo, and then they would do the um, stipple, which is fill in the um, empty space in that. Um, most of the time they would do them on their appliques. Um, they would appliques the, um, the pieces on, like we had applique a lot of times. Um, they did the machine applique too. Um, and the quilting designs were usually with black or white thread, although some of the threads um, they did have color threads so they could match the color of whatever they were working on at that time too. Um, and they used batting that was usually pretty thin. Um, probably, like if you feel the batting up here is probably the, the thickness that they used. It's really thin. Um, so when you, afterwards you come up and feel how thin the batting was. Um, this. The um, blocks, let's start with the blocks and the history. Um, <coughs> because they were walking or going different places, a lot of the blocks were called um, Road to California, Road to Kansas, uh, or Rocky Road to Kansas. Um, they were, um, let me see, stuff. I'm trying to find all their names. Um, Oregon Trail, Path in the Wilderness, Wild Geese, Pine Tree, um, California Rose, and <coughs> Ohio Star, and even Delectable Mountains, which they said that one was reference to geography and Jonathan Swift's work, Prairie Queen. Oh, excuse me, Jonathan Swift's work. Prairie Queen, they actually said Calamity Jane used that. She, that's what she was called at one time. And so somebody named the block Prairie Rose for after her. Um, uh, most of the blocks have dual names. Um, I, I actually was going to bring the book, but I forgot it. It has like, it, I have a book that has 5,500 quilt blocks. Um, but like Jacob's Ladder has probably 20 or 25 different variations on it. The log cabin has five or six different variations on it. Um, and so a lot, a lot of the blocks are um, the same block, like Drunkard's Path and um, Robin Peter and Pay Paul. It's actually the same block, they just positioned it different and they gave it a different name. Um, all the name blocks of the, um, that have been named they're all anonymous. <coughs> Nobody knows who's, who named them. They just sort of came up with the name. Um, it could be called Wandering Foot, 
in one part of the country and turkey traps in the other part. But you never want to make a wandering foot and put it on your son's crib because they'll say he'll never want to stay in one place. He'll want to wander the rest of his life. <laughs> and that. So um, there's a lot of folklore involved in quilts too, and I'll get to that in a little bit too. But um, so, like I said, a lot of these blocks have more than one name, and that. So um, the Bible was also another popular. Um, names they took out of the Bible, like the Rose of Sharon is probably the most popular applique block. Um, and they also have um, the, it, and all the blocks kind of akin to their spiritual perfection and recollect, recollection of, um, of a Savior. And there's also Jacob's Ladder and Job's Tears, Crown of Thorns, Crosses and Losses, Cross and Crown, King Solomon's Tempo, Job's Troubles, Joseph's Color, or Joseph's Coat, The Rugged Cross, Road to Jerusalem, and The Tree of Life. And of course there's many more. And they actually say like the um the um uh, Lone Star also is called the Star of Bethlehem. So it actually has two names also. Um, American cities, they named after American cities, is there's one, Annapolis, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Chicago, Kansas City, Santa Fe, Salt Lake City, um, Charleston, Savannah, just a few. But every state has a block. They have made a quilt block for every state. That, so if you want to make a block or state blocks, you, you got 50, 51, 50 of them to do. Um, Unless they add a state that I don't remember or don't know about. Um, some of the, um, let's see here. Okay, didn't they, like I said, because they were traveling, they have the road to Oklahoma, um, the road to California, and Arkansas, Kansas, um, and some other ones. Um, and then also they say picking a name for your quilt is just as important as um, picking a name when you pick your name for your child. Again, you don't want to put your child, you know, name, wandering foot on your son's bed because of him wandering up. You want an appropriate name for your quilt and you always, you'll come up with something. It always comes to you. Um, so women during the Civil War um, they would take care, when the men were gone, they ended up taking care of their farms, the animals, their children, and had to make a living at doing all this. Um, some of the women um, worked the farms. Some of them got jobs outside the home, doing jobs that they were allowed to do. Um, a lot of the women left um, and followed their husbands to war, and they would work in field hospitals. And a lot of the women actually... Um, dress themselves as men to fight alongside the men. Um, there's one story where a woman dressed up and she actually fought next to her husband and he was uh, work, um, was part of the cannon artillery firing. And so he died and she took over his spot after he was killed. Um, they all, Women also, they would stay home um, and they started making quilts because the military only gave them so much um, of material, of uniforms, and they were always short. You know, after so many, after so long, things start wearing out. So the women would make quilts. They would knit socks. Um, they started having. Um, they would actually wrap off quilts to raise money to buy medicine. They made bandages for the soldiers, and they would send them out. They um, the it was the um, United States Sanitary Commission was founded in 1861. And it was to promote cleanliness in the hospitals. And um, they said once it started, disease and that went down by half. Once um, the, it started really going out. And um, they, they would have um, auctions or like fairs, sanitary um, fairs. And they would uh, sell baked goods, um, craft items that they made, things like that. And they said at one time they raised um, $25 million in support. And it's estimated that the women gave as many as 250,000 quilts. 
and and comforters, which again, which are the soldiers in camps in that. And here's an example of one of the quilts that they would give the soldiers. It was just big enough that it would just cover them up. And we just cover them up and keep them warm. Um, a lot of times, like in the South, the women would hide their quilts and their, along with their valuables to keep them safe. Um, I have a book up here and they have um, a picture in it where uh, a soldier had stolen one of the quilts and it was an applique quilt and he had cut a hole in it and he wore it as a poncho. And they actually, you could see where they sewed it back, you know, pieced it back together at that when, it's, when somebody else had found it. Um, but the, th the fairs had raised, um, thought was run by thousands of women and they volunteered and they actually became very popular and they raised more funds than they ever expected. And they said in some cases at the fairs they were raised an equivalent to four million dollars, our, our time money, which is still a lot of money for them back there, back then. Um, right now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read a few, um, letters that were written from the soldiers home and then I have a couple of the um, diary um, that women have wrote in their diaries while the men were gone and then after that um, I'll take questions in that. Um, this one was actually wrote from a rebel soldier named Andrew Gatewood and this was wrote August 4th 1860. Dear Paul and Ma, I have written to Ma once and now it is my time to write to you. I have gotten much to tell you all. I know I've arrived here safe and entered the Institute on last Wednesday. I paid Colonel Smith the money and took his receipt for it. I tell you, this is a hard place. I have been intimidated and it went pretty, or initiated and it went pretty hard with, with me. They whipped me with the bayonet, scabboard, and they spelt my name, country, and state the Virginia military institute and what class you entered. You know what they mean by spelling you is they tie your hands together, put them over your legs or knees, and then <coughs> run a stick between your legs. Turn you over and then whip you with the bayonet. They call you, they call it fucking you. They give you a lick for every letter in your name, country, state, Virginia military institute, and what class you enter. I do tell it hurts awful bad. They twist your arms nearly off, and I don't know what they can't do. We are all in camp now. It is a hard way of living. We go to bed every night at 10 p.m. and get up at 5 a.m. They don't allow you but three minutes to dress in the morning, and then roll is, roll, the roll is called. I was awful homesick for two or three days. I believe if I had my money back, I would have come home, but I bet you like it better now. We have pretty good fare. Tell William B. Gatewood there are four little boys here, not a, little, not a bit larger than he is, and they get along first rate. Give my love to Bias. Tell him to give him, to be a good boy and write to me. I will still, it will soon be time for us to go, and I will have to stop. I have been pretty homesick for three or four days, but I am getting over it. I would like mighty to see you to see you all, but I can't. I reckon for some time. Excuse all mistakes as I am in a powerful hurry. Goodbye, write soon, your son, ACL Gatewood. <clears throat> this one's from um, Rutherford B. Hayes. He was a Yankee. Um, July 27th, 1861. Dear wife, our second day from Bel Air to this place was an exceedingly happy one. We traveled about 130 miles in Virginia and with the exception of one deserted village of um, secessionist, we, we were received everywhere with enthusiasm. I never saw anything before. No such great crowds turn out to meet us as we saw from Indianapolis to Cincinnati, assembled to see Lincoln. <coughs> but everywhere in the, in the calm and hay fields, in the houses, in the roads, on the hills, whatever human being saw us, we saw such honest, spontaneous, demonstration of joy as we never beheld elsewhere. Old men and women, boys and children, some feverly prayed for us, some laughed and some cried. All did something which told the story. The secret of it is the defeat at Washington 
and the Department of Thousands of Three Months Men of Ohio and Indiana led them to fear they were left to the rebels of Eastern Virginia. We were the first three-year men filling the places of those who left. It was pleasant to see we were not invading an enemy's country, but defending the people among whom we came. Our men enjoy it beyond measure. Many had never seen a mountain. None have ever seen such a reception. They stood on top of the cars and danced and shouted with delight. We got here in the night. General Rose is with us. No other full regiment here. We march tomorrow up the mountain. You know, you, excuse me, you would enjoy such a ride as that of yesterday as much as I did. It was perfect. Now comes the hard work. Goodbye, love to all, affectionately, Rutherford. And then on April 12, 1865, he wrote, Dearest, I wonder if you feel as I do, the close of the war, <clears throat> home again, darling, and the boys and all to be together again for good, and the matter of it too, our best general vindicated by having the greatest victory. General Cook, Crook too, did you see it was his immediate command that captured so much, which Sheridan telegraphs about the wagons, Armstrong's guns, etc. Almost gratifying my expedition <coughs> into the mountains will no doubt be given up. Although we are still preparing, I am well satisfied with the present matters personally, and I think I am rather fortunate. All things considered, I decided that nothing at present. I wish you to be ready to join me on, every sh on very short notice. It is not likely I shall send for you, but I may do so any day if you would like to come. My notion is that an extra session of Congress soon is a likely thing to occur. That will be known in a week or two. Love to all so much as ever, Rutherford. P.S. My picture being in demand, I have got, have got another. Um, this is a rebel, um, David Reed Evans Wynn, and his last letter home was on June 9, 1863. He died in one of the first charges of Gettysburg, but this is before the um, charge he had wrote. Uh, May 16, 1861. Um, my dear wife, I received your very kind letter yesterday and was truly rejoiced to learn that you and our dear children were fortunate enough to escape being on the cars when the accident occurred above Americus. Truly, it must have been pr providential and we ought to be and I hope are extremely thankful. I am grieved to see that you are distressing yourself about me. Again, it ought it ought greatly to comfort you that I get off from home so early. For any that may have to go hereafter, our pledge for the three years of the war. I cannot get home if alive at the end of one year. If the war does not come upon soon, we may meet much earlier. Your fears of my overworking myself are perfectly groundless. I am growing fat on high living and regular exercise. Just take as good care of yourself as I am taking and purpose to take care of myself, and I'm sure that I will be delighted by meeting you, a stout, healthy woman on my return. Take good care of poor little Cooper and Deer. The impossible, impossibility of seeing you and them constitutes my greatest trial. The hope of early restoration to, to my dear family, my greatest constellation. We are all still at the Navy Yard somewhat more pleasantly quartered than when I wrote you last, in consequence of the removal of far companions out of our house. The life in camp imagined from holiday encampment, etc., has not lost considerably its pleasantness, although we have not yet encountered the roar of cannon and whistling of bullets. The uniform round of duty is becoming wearisome, and the men gladly great an order for extra work, even though it, it to be built embankments, dig ditches, or mount canyons. Harder work than any of them have ever been used to. My position is comparatively, comparatively a pleasant one. Without the responsibility of the captain, I am relieved from all work except drilling the men and such like duty. Kiss my boys and receive the devotion of your affectionate husband, David. I could scarcely scribble this out, writing as I am on a single sheet of paper on a board. Okay, and then this is November 3rd, 1863, from the headquarters of um, Dole's Brigade, and it's to his wife. 
um, Madam and Secretary of the Meeting of the Field, and love him truly. And while his frank and offerable <coughs> manner, his war and loyal impulses, his devotion <coughs> to the truth and night, no less than his heightened chivalry and sublime heroism, has endeared him to all. And yet only those who knew him intimately could fully know his worth or appreciate his loss. With the assurance of my sincere sympathy and condolence, I am very respectful, <coughs> F.T. Um, Sneed. And then on the diaries, um, this one's from Emma Florence Furman, and she was born in Georgia, and this is February 14, 1864. What a panic the whole town is in. I have been out of the house myself. I have not been out of the house myself, but Father says the intense excitement prevails on the streets. The Yankees are report, reported a few miles off on the other side of the river. How strong, no one knows. It is decided, if this be true, that we will remain quietly here. Um, farther along, leaving, farther left alone, um, it is thought... Columbia can hardly be taken by a raid as we have the whole of, the whole of Butler's cavalry here. And if they do, we have to take the consequences. It is true some think Sheridan will burn the town, but we can hardly believe that. Besides these buildings, though they are state property, yet the fact that they are used as a hospital, well, it is thought to protect them. I have been hastily making large pockets to wear under my hoop skirt for they will hardly search our persons. Still, everything of any value is to be packed up to go with Father. I do not feel half so frightened as I thought I would, perhaps because I cannot realize they are coming. I hope this is still a false report. Maggie Adams and her husband have promised to stay here during Father's absence. She is a Yankee and maybe some protection and help. Our sufferings will probably be of short duration as they will hardly send more than a raid. They would not have come to occupy the town, but I cannot believe that they are coming. And then on April 21st, she wrote, um, 1864, Hooray! Oh, Abe Lincoln has been assassinated. It may be ab abstractly wrong to be so jubilant, but I just can't help it. After all the heaviness and gloom of yesterday, this blow to our enemies comes like a gleam of light. We have suffered till we feel savage. There is, seems no reason to exalt, for this will make no change in our position. We will only infuriate them against us. Never mind, our hatred enemy has not the just reward of his life. The whole story may be a Yankee he, the dispatch purpose to be from Stanton to Sherman. It says Lincoln was murdered in his private box at the theater on the night of the 14th, Good Friday at the theater. The assassin brandished a dagger and shouting, Sepper Tyrannus. Virginia is avenged. Shot the president through the head. He fell senseless and expired the next day a little after 10. The assassin, assassin made his escape in the crowd. No doubt it was regularly planned and he was surrounded by southern sympathizers. <clears throat> Could there have been a fitter death for such a man? At the same hour, nearly Stewart's house was um, entered. He was badly wounded, as was his son. Why could it not be that, why could not the assassin have done his work more thoroughly? That vile steward, he is, he it is to whom we owe this war. It is a shame that he should escape. And then this one is from Mary Austin Wallace from Michigan. And she, she wrote um, very short entries. It's that October 15, 1862, I stripped sugar cane all day and October 22nd, 1862. Pa and I finished cleaning up the wheat. Pa drew a load of sand. I went to Mr. Waterman to see about working up the sugar. Also to see Mr. Story about doing mason work. He was not at home. His wife said she thought he, would, he could not come over for five or six weeks. October 23rd. I took a load to the mill, came back, and stayed all night at Mother Key's. October 24th. I came home and loaded the remainder of the sugar cane. I took it to the mill. I got my molasses, over 17 gallons, and paid him $4 for making it. Coming home, I stopped at Mother Key's and got two letters dated 13th and 14th from Bruce. Came on home and covered the corn crib. October 25th, I unloaded my molasses 
loaded up seven banks of cheese and two bushels of wheat for flour. I went to the union with my grist. I took no, November 1st, I finished digging potatoes and the sugar cane and picked them up and buried them. And on November 18th, I drew three loads of wood, went to Mother Keys and borrowed a wheel and a reel. I came home and spun over three knots of yarn and gathered some cabbage. November 20th, I dug potatoes and picked them up. I washed my yarn. November 21st, I cut some wood and wound up my yarn and set me a knitting work to make. Who's the pair of socks? I dug some potatoes and picked them up. And that was yeah. them. Um, and some of the notes that the women had sent with the quilts were, um, my dear friend, you are not my husband or son, but you are, some, you are the husband or son of some woman who undoubtedly loves you as I love mine. I have made these garments for you with the heart that sells for your sufferings. Um, my son is in the army. Whoever, whoever is made warm with this quilt, which I have worked on for six days and the greater part of six nights, let him remember his own mother's love. And this blanket was carved by or carried by Millie Aldrich, who is 93 years old, downhill and uphill, one and a half miles to be given to some soldier. And that's just some of the notes that they had enclosed in there. And that is it. Any questions? <laughs> Where did you get the information for your notes? Um, I got them out of these books here. Uh -huh. Some of them was um, the Civil War Diary Quilts. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then... Um, and then I got... Um, the dying ones were out of the um, dye books. You said something about a matter plant to make your brown? Yes. M A T T E R. M A D D E R. M A D D. Matter. Like dog? Yeah. D like dog. Yeah. <laughs> and what what does it look like before it's harvested? Um, there's a picture in here. Is it big like a rhubarb or something like that? Um, yes. And they actually just use the root. I think we've all heard a lot about dyeing with onion skin and different yes, things. I, yeah. But uh, I never heard of this word before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they actually had, um, everybody, all the women uh, mostly had recipes, a home recipe or tried and true that they had in their kitchen because they did, they used um, butternut and walnuts were real good for browns. Um, they also used the onion skins and, um, um, let's see here, choke berries, um, grape juice, red cabbage, carrot tops, beets, blue irises, blueberries, um, chrysanthemums, corn flour, elderberries, um, marigolds, um, sapphire or safflower, um, St. John's wort, sunflower, um, ragweed, sumac, sumac um, pokeberry, sorrel, um, milkweed, tulip trees, um, sassafras. So, and that's just red clover, tansy. Those are all natural ones that they. Um, they would use. Here's what the root looks like. It's well, huh. Does it say if it, <coughs> if it grows in Indiana? Um, th it doesn't. Hmm. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. No, California. No, wait, that's not it. Um, it actually doesn't. Wyoming. Okay. An abundance of it in Wyoming. <laughs> but not in... Um, Indiana, because uh -huh. <laughs> I'm actually going to try and grow a lot of these for <laughs> for uh, to to just to do it next year, you know, to have it with you know in my garden, a dyer's garden, and that. Um, some of and some of them were in here too about um, what flowers or things you know to use for dyeing and that. So and a lot of it's in your backyard or close enough you could get it. And that so, mm -hmm. yes. Do they always use plant material on the back sides of the quilt? 
Um, sometimes they would it would bleed through whatever um, you see on the back side is just what bled through to the back side. So they never printed on it on purpose. No, I think she meant on the back of the quilt is all pattern. Oh, on the on the back of on the, the quilt. Back, these are all pattern instead of um, plain. Some of them would be pattern, some would be plain. They would um I don't know if I have one here. Um some of them would be like just like this fabric. Um I have one that they would take you could piece it, strips together and make strips on the back. They would just use their sc scraps is what they're using. They never, um, and I tried to find out how much fabric cost back then, but I, it kept, was not taking me to where I needed to go. But they weren't, you know, they were using their scraps. They wouldn't then, go buy new fabric. People used to, uh, to like you, you made a dress and the front got dirty and it couldn't come clean, and then they used the back for quilt patches and stuff. Yeah. I read that in quite a few books. Mm -hmm. too, yeah, they would just take the better part of the garments and, mm -hmm. and use them. For yeah, them. and they also um, they would wear two aprons too, so they always kept you know, one kept dirty and we had one to be clean <laughs> underneath. So yeah, and that. So, Mary. <coughs> come in in the Civil War? Like what year? Um, it did. I heard it came in actually after the Civil War, Paisley, oh. because when we do the reenactments, mm -hmm. like if a man has a Paisley shirt on, we call him the Civil War Patrol. You know, the, everything okay. has to be authentic. Yeah. Um, they I, get on you when you wear Paisley, and that's why I was just curious when you were saying that. I'll so, have to look it up for sure. But okay, because I just heard it was after. Right. The Civil War, like shortly after it. So I was just curious. Yeah. Um, I might have, I have, I actually have a book here somewhere. I just don't know where I put it. But okay. I'll find it. So. Okay, yeah, because I'm just curious. Yeah, I'll find it. Because we saw the clothes for it. Right. And I was just curious, did you see a lot of it? And they all say do not use, you know, anything with a zipper, even if it's right. like costume type zippers. You gotta have odd number buttons. Yes. Yeah. You know, the extra button has to be on the shirt. And they said absolutely no paisley. And then you brought up paisley and I was just Yeah. I actually I have a book of the fabrics. Okay. So yeah. It's up here somewhere underneath all this stuff. Okay. So I'll find it for you yeah. so you can look at it. So how did they get that? Well, the patterns? Mm -hmm. If they dying there. Was there the material? Well, well some of it was dyed, but a lot of this was already made on the machines. Okay. They, so they the purchased factory, it. Yeah, they purchased it, and then it was left over after they made their dresses or their clothes and that. But would they have woven any of their own? Or? Well, yeah, they did. They did. That was the um, Lindsay Woolley stuff. Okay. That that was <coughs> what they homespun. Homespun. Yeah, the homespun and that. So. Yes. You mentioned their use of denims. Does your memory tell you when denim was introduced? Um, no. I'll have to look it up for you. 49 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They yeah, used 49, 49, yeah. yeah 49. That, you know, and I was thinking as I was writing that down, too. Was, that, was it introduced then or before then? Um, that's when it really became popular okay. because the um, coal, <coughs> I mean, out there in the gold rush, that's all they had. Um, Mr. Levi. If you could see the prices, and they said girls, yeah. they wrote the, they made jeans. They you they it said that they used the um, the cotton jeans because it was cheap fabric back then. I go if he could see how much <laughs> the <laughs> Levi <laughs> jeans cost <laughs> now, you know, <laughs> they're, they're not the cheap jeans out there anymore. You know? Then you buy them half worn out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> with, with the holes in them. Yeah, with the holes in them. Yeah, with the holes holes. Them. But yeah, the 1849, or yeah, when they went out there during the gold rushes, when he really <coughs> did the blue jeans out there, and then my mind's just sort of like. <laughs> you talked about the political things, like the the white the white material. That's yes, got the, the eagles and that on it. Yeah. Uh, how did they do those stamping patterns? They they, they had um just like us. Uh, the women stamp. didn't create their own. No, they bought this that. is what they bought. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all this fabric is what they would have bought. Like the homespun I showed, like this, they would have made themselves. And that, and this again, it's like weaving, you know, and stuff. So they would have done this. 
but to get the pattern to that, that's what they have bought. Someone else, oh yes. Uh, this last October, uh, my husband and I went to Texas, and we were fortunate to get to the Texas Civil War Museum, which is the largest Civil War Museum west of the Mississippi. And in one huge room, they had a display of women's dresses, women and children's dresses, wow. from just before the Civil War to the 1890s. Wow. And what you ladies would be interested in was the type of patterns that I saw that I had no idea were being worn at such an early date. But what you're forgetting maybe is that we had imports from France and England, Italy, China, uh, for many, many years uh, up until the Civil War. And uh, in the early 1800s, we were very, very uh, affected by what was hot in Europe. Right. right. So the wealthy in America were already buying beautiful fabrics before the onset of the Civil War. And then, of course, that's when they did a lot of their own fabric making right. because they were poor. And while there, I, they had a fantastic library. I bought a book which talked about what women did to make do during the Civil War as far as uh, making their own uh, food when there wasn't proper food there to, to cook with, uh, weaving their own things, carving their own things, repairing their furniture, working in the fields. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating. If any of you think you have hard times now, <laughs> or even during World War II when we all gave up, right? All, everyone in this country gave up, World War I and II. Uh, it was very fascinating. If you're ever interested, uh, it's a good read. And then it, they had a lot of letters that were talking about uh, what the women had to go through, how they were starving, literally, especially those who didn't have animals. So uh, I, was, I was blown away by the intricacy of the quilts, and I did see the, the quilts made for soldiers. The beautiful, the stitches per inch were yeah. phenomenal. And you think, now these ladies were doing this by daylight, by candlelight. Yeah, and uh, it, it just blows the mind, the quality and the love that went into these things. And the lacing, the tatting that was being done. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 They well, also the made, um, yeah, I was going to ask you. Um, they made, oh, oh. oh. I can't remember. Can you email John? John? I'll email John and find out. Yeah. <laughs> they made um, <laughs> sewing kits for the guys. Yeah, they were sent to them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that the, they were called housewives, so that they had their little yeah. sewing thing with them. And then some of them would just send like this little needle kit, and they could still put little thread and needles in here and that. So they even um, made covers for their Bibles. Yeah, one of them in the museum had blood on it. Oh, um, yeah, th that was the way they could show love. And when they didn't have any money, they could send this off in a letter. Their handkerchiefs with hand lace, handmade lace. Yeah, yeah. And that's really interesting. Yeah, be <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they did. Um, I know they. You said you know Victorian. They did follow like Queen Victoria. She was in when she was in her mourning dress and stuff. She wore stripes, so that's when a lot of the stripes started coming out because of her. Um, she was in stripes, so the mayor, you know, we're like, okay, we got to do it. Mm -hmm. And actually, the South gave. A, uh, I mean, they were a big percentage of their cotton that they grew went over to England and France to make the fabric. But then again, with the embargoes, they stopped the flow going out. Um, what helped that was uh, for the mm -hmm. northern is we captured uh, New Orleans and Memphis and we got the um, waterways in the Mississippi River mm -hmm. to get the cotton and things in and out. So that was a big help for us. But You say you're going to be talking about period quilts different times? <coughs> um, next um, in April I'm talking about the Depression era. Quilts. Okay, and then how did you get started on these? Are there some were some of these through your family members? No, or? actually I've made them all. Oh, you've made them? Yeah, oh. I've made all the quilts. Um, my grandmother and great aunt quilted, and I just, uh -huh. I'm the only granddaughter that inherited the... The, I, the one, the, the white square block. This one? Then the next one. I want to see that one. You you mentioned that there is a no you don't you don't have to bring it here just you mentioned that there is that the one where you mentioned there was an extra block in it no well, that's no, not no, the one that's no, adjoining no. block she's talking about adjoining oh block. the um the adjoining brown block pink. oh the pink, pink, brown. It's the pink and brown yeah yeah that's, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, now what are you calling it? Right here. Like this black right here. Like bow tie. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bow tie. Thank you. That's cool. 
because they're all mm -hmm. the same. And yet that doesn't look prominent, does it? No, because what comes out is your is your your brown square. Right. Yeah. Because when I put this on on the design wall and I start looking, I go, Wow, I got two designs out of this. You yeah, know? there is. Yeah. yeah. Well, now take your take your second row of blocks. See, you come down here. You got the you got the, your nine patch in the middle, in the second row, right there. The next one down. The next row down. The next oh, row down. This one. The next one over to your yeah, there. Right there's the nine patch. Right. What are you calling the next one to it? This one? Yeah. Um, I have to look at my book. See, then, that's, <laughs> then the next one is different, and the next one yeah, is there, different. Yeah, there's 50-some there's yeah, there's books, uh, yeah. 50 some blocks, piece blocks, not this one, not <coughs> kind of oh, this okay. one. Not kind of this one. one. is a windmill. Yeah, okay. all the other blocks are all are all um, different. They're all different. Uh -huh. yeah. That's why I couldn't find any repetition there. Yeah, they're all different. Oh, a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do have the list of all the blocks because I brought the book. Cause and what I, is this book called? Then? This is just called Pink and Brown. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, Pink and Brown. <laughs> yeah, it's got a little of that. Yeah, yeah. Just Pink yeah. and Brown. That's easy enough. <laughs> yeah. 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 This was actually, um, I work at a cold shop in Valparaiso, oh, Neil and Red, and this was a block of the week. Oh, and that's so, how you had that. Uh huh. So, now in uh, your top row, you have something similar to a log cabin, yeah, almost, but it's not. It's like um, Lincoln's platform. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh -huh. What is the one? Not a top row or over? Yeah, okay. this looks like a windmill. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think yeah, that is called like a windmill. windmill. Uh -huh. I'll have to, but like I said, I have the book, so and I have them all in order. I think so. <laughs> I can that look them up. Really oh, that yeah. is Did you yeah, quote this by hand? Yes, I hand quote all mine by hand. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. You have a big frame that you put up yourself and just leave it? Mm -hmm. I have three. Uh -huh. <laughs> in the garage or in the dining room? <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> I get the basement. <laughs> yeah, I have. I actually have more than three, but... Um, One year when, when we first put up the new building here in Cowitz, and I was in seventh grade, and so this was the first year that I ever got to draw a pattern of a, or a plan of our house at home. And so we were supposed to draw the dining room and what was in it. Well, in the middle of our dining room was our dining room table. And on the north window, there was an old couch that went out against the wall that went out in the pantry. And between that was a quilt stand that we always put in there. So yeah. I put that quilt stand in there. I didn't know it wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> well, a lot of them, they hung from the ceiling. Yeah. So they go yeah, and they crank them up we rolled it up. We don't okay. roll it every night and roll it back up so you know, so that we could all eat yeah. and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, Also, like, they did, um, like, hexagons um, was actually, like, the first pattern ever printed in a book. And it was in the ladies' goodie book. Yeah. And... Um, it was, of course, paper piece, and they, they found quilts, different ones, where um, when they start falling apart, there's still the newspapers. So the women use like, a lot of the newspapers for patterns, because you know, the material, you know, they didn't have plastic like we have, or the cardboard, so they would take um, the newspaper and cut out their patterns, because you know, they had to do it the old way, cut with scissors, not the rotary yeah, cutter yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So I got an old sunbonnet <laughs> yeah. pattern that my grandmother cut for me out of newspaper. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. And explain the difference. The Mariner's Compass? Yes. Yeah. This yeah. is also, also, I didn't mention this block. This is the Mariner's Compass block, and they did make these. Um, this one's very precise because it's paper piece. Um, I couldn't find if they paper pieced theirs or if they sold them all by hand. Of course, back then, they would have, if they did sew it by hand. Yeah. Huh? A lot of people wouldn't even have a mail of one. Yeah. Paper. Um, they would have sold it by hand and they would have been more precise than us nowadays, you know, and that. So, but they did make this in the, um, during the Civil War. Are you going to make a wall hanging out of that? Or yeah. are you going to finish it? Yeah. I'm going to make a little wall. And then how would you quilt it? Um, I'm probably just going to do come up in points mm -hmm. and then in just the ditch. meander. I don't know if I'll do it in the ditch or not. Um, I may. i seen one that when they did it, they just made a, a rounded edge and I got fed in. No, that doesn't no. do anything. No, because no. it's, it's points. It needs points, you know, so. Yeah. Have you heard that um, I read in a magazine from about the slaves? When the slaves were running away, they would have quilts on the oh the railroad, and they yeah. would sell their path 
as to how they could go that was safe by the cliff that yeah. we're on. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. The underground railroad. Yeah. 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 Did you know that? And that. So, um, yeah, they, they did have that. Sandy, explain to me too the paper, how that was done. The paper piecing? Mm -hmm. um, the paper piecing is there's, uh, you get a pattern and you make like, like this one, I need eight copies of this pattern. So, um, I would take you take the pattern and then it has like number one, two, three, four, five. I think there was six or something on this six. And then you put your first and second um, piece of fabric. Like I would take this one and one of these little ones and I would, it says one and two. So you put one and two together and then you got to put it on the back side. So you gotta look at it through the um, up in the light, so you can make sure you got it in the right place. And then you turn it back over, and you sew on the line between one and two. And then um, you turn it back over, and then you 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 find number three, and you fold that paper up to number three. You fold it with a cardboard, and then you put a ruler against it, like it's called a quarter inch ruler. And then you cut along that to get rid of the extra fabric. So you cut one piece at a time as you go, you mean? Um, kind of. You do this one piece at a time, or two pieces. You start out with two pieces, but then it's one so piece at a time. So you have it on paper? Huh? You have actually have it on paper? Yes, yeah, just to start. And so when you turn, when, when I turned it over, I saw all this together. So when I sewed all this together, this was all paper. So then you have to go back in and tear it all out. Tear the paper out. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you're talking about paper, right? You're talking about paper, paper, or newspaper? Or um, you can use, paper? Well, I, I, it's, a, it's a thinner paper. It's like newspaper weight. It's not like um, print paper. It's it's thinner, like newspaper weight. You buy it at a quilt shop, you mean? Yeah, you can, but you can also go buy, you know, like you go to the dollar store and they have like that um, drawing paper for kids for a buck. You can use that. Because oh, yeah. it's just the thin stuff and that, so. So they would have used newspaper. They would have used newspaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, it has mm -hmm. each number, so I know how, where to follow, how to follow it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, to get it where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. Yes? This might really sound off the wall. Is there an actual reason for quilting? Keep you warm. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's to relieve tension. Not yeah, to make stress. It. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, they didn't drink back then, so you know, look out. Yeah, recycling. Yeah, recycling. Reuse, recycle. Because um, they, you couldn't, they, they didn't have much, so they couldn't, they wouldn't throw away their fabric scraps because um, they could make a quilt out of it. Even now, I have bins of scraps of pieces of fabric that I'm like, I mean, that are like an inch or skirt. I try to stay an inch and bigger because um, I have bins. <laughs> you know, that I, I've already started making string quilts and things, but yeah, I have bins of fabric that, because I save and make quilts out of them. But so then the real whole reason that there's quilts is people have leftover scraps. Right. Yeah, yeah, and and it keeps them warm. Yeah. And they go, here's a use. We'll make quilts and yeah. keep them warm. And make it begins to be self-expression. <laughs> huh? It begins to become self-expression. Yeah, right. and now you know, like it is an I do traditional quilts. You know, I do the thirty style. I do Civil War. But there's people out there that do portrait quilts and real artsy stuff. Um, in fact, next month there's a quilt show in Valpar or, yeah, Valparaiso at the Porter Expo Center. I think it's like the fifth and sixth or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. And they have a lot of artsy people there that have like portraits and then they have a lot of traditional quilts and that. So I saw one done out of neckties. Yeah, I've actually, I've actually done a necktie. Her husband passed away, and so she gave me his ties, and I made little ties on like little shirts, and so you know, I made memory quilts out of t-shirts and things like that. So, yeah, I have one I would like to share. Okay, <laughs> it's a crazy quilt. That's okay. And my great great grandmother made it, and 
maybe somebody can give me some suggestions or something as to. I know you're supposed to. Oh, sorry. You're supposed to not fold it the no. same way each time. Or the best thing is to roll it. Oh, okay. And then um, store it. And just so you know, don't fold your quilts if you're going to um, store them, roll them. And don't put them in a plastic bag. Put them in a pillowcase or something. Yeah. Oh, this, oh, this is beautiful. This was my great grandmother's name. That was the, our Kelsey was our my great my great grandmother and grandfather's name. Could you hold it up higher? Oops, sorry. Should, should we stand on the table? <laughs> Thank you. Um, somewhere on here, it has her mate right here. She uh, stitched her uh, maiden name, which was Annie Elliott. Yeah. Russell. Russell, that was my grandfather, and his birth date was 1893, is that what it says? Mm -hmm. And then her, his brother Roy is down there somewhere, and his, right there, 1895, and then his May. sister, May 19, or 1899. How old is this? They're all kinds of red. Yeah. No idea. After 1899. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it was well, made then. Well, that's when she was born, so. There's a red ribbon for something. Yeah, this she's got is, a lot of ribbons. This is the UP Band yeah. Picnic, August 11, 1888. Oh, wow. And there's a lining from hats, the inside of the inside of hats. This says Hayes, 1776 for Hayes, 1876. I don't know what. I don't know what that is either. <laughs> you can see a definite place where these were put onto something and then set together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, there's a yeah. square yeah. here. And the squares and yeah. this is nice. Right. Yeah. 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 I have a quilt that they used uh, <laughs> sugar bags for the Oh, yeah. 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 And the flower sacks would have been used. Yeah. 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 That's next. That's the April talk. Yeah, I should have brought the wrong time. This one says Victory 1884. Who's the president? Grover Cleveland. Has that re been redacted? Yeah. yeah. It came to me like this. I'm. I. My guess is that the. Top was done, but it was never had a back. And then somebody yeah. put the back. Somebody put the back on. Somebody back on. Yeah. But I had you heard it. How they tied like it on the back. Yes. Yeah. So it didn't take away from right. the front. From the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, really and each yeah, is. block oh, is stitched with a different embroidery stitch too. So that's velvet and silk. That's called that chicken tracks. Yeah. 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 Turkey tracks. Yeah. Turkey tracks. Yeah. You can tell like the satin, the silk starting to go. Yes, it is. There's some of them that are like gone because they're. Two they're, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, very like silky. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. There's some of them that are gone. And, gone, yeah. gone. Yeah. This one is the fire alarm numbers. I mean, I think of that. But, you know, um, <laughs> tell me what to do. No, with you know what? what? I have a friend, and I, I, I couldn't find her cards because I was going to bring it. But if you give me your name and number, I have a friend that actually um, appraises quilts. She appraisal okay. Yeah. She well, I would never. Get rid of it. Well, yeah, I know, but for insurance, for insurance I think yeah, I should be doing charges, something with it. She I think, like thirty or forty dollars to do an yeah. appraisal, and she takes the paper. I mean, she takes a picture and does all the paperwork. Oh, that'd be great. And, and for insurance she, reasons, you really need it. Yeah, and really she also talked about this. Right she did here. that for us so last year and talk mm -hmm. about the proper care. And yeah, repairs. yeah, that's what I Because actually, the only thing I could tell you, because I have done See, this um, one's going. worked with textiles when I worked for the state. Um, done in um, Historic New Harmony. Um, mm -hmm. To clean it, you could put like a get like a um, mm -hmm. a screen, but not the metal ones, but like the whatever they're made out of now. Yeah, yeah. Did you and again? put a screen on it, and then your vacuum with the carpet. I mean, oh, with the awesome. brush, and you just just go over it lightly, and that will take up the dust without mm -hmm. hurting the. Um, Fabric, fabric, because you leave that you lay, lay that screen on there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's what we used to do for our textiles yeah, sure. and things. Yeah, well. so but I, give me your name and number, and I'll have my okay. friend get in touch with you because um, you no, 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 no. <laughs> you really need. For, um, <laughs> I thought maybe we did the spin the straw. Oh, yeah. No, no. Like Actually, I just moved and I I took it yeah, out of. They are. Uh, they are. Uh, uh, I just yeah, took it out and refolded it again because somebody it told me like not to always fold it the same way all the time. So. Oh, there probably is. Yeah. Like this is yeah. 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 So I want to yeah. display it, but I don't want to ruin it yeah. by displaying yeah. it. So. Yeah. 
And I took it to a family reunion, and there was almost a fight. So, because oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there were a lot of them, there were a lot of them that didn't know it existed, and I didn't know it existed either. The only way so. to hang it would be put a hanging a pocket, arm, like, pocket on it, and then keep it out of the light. Yeah. It has to be out of the direct light. But I'll give me your number and stuff, and I'll give it to my friend and. Um, <laughs> Because like I said, she doesn't That's what I pray for. <laughs> Find out what to do with Like I said, I usually have a card, but I couldn't find them today. It's just like one of those. <laughs> That's why I brought it to find out what to do with it. Yep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll get it. Okay. We'll get it uh, fixed up. <laughs> Good deal. Thank you. Ah, no yeah. problem. See, there's pieces on the floor. It's coming apart. Any more questions? No. No, no that ain't it. I know you just did the... Uh, that ain't nice. Yes, the mirror looks Yes, I don't have one. Um, <laughs> if I if I worked on it, I could have had I could have had two parts. So like eight hours, ten hours. Okay. Right. How about a large quilt? A large quilt. Um, to do like the um, soldier's cot quilt, mm -hmm. that took me probably like a week. Working day. To, to cut it out, piece it together, layer it together, and start quilting. Yeah. Probably took me, yeah. And if they're bigger, um, like this one, it probably took me a month to quilt it. How did you mark your stitching? Did you use a color? I used a potato's um, chalk or something? Yes. Well, actually, what I used is uh, um, one of those pens that the... Uh, Disappears? Yeah. Disappears. Mm -hmm. Well, it actually comes out with water. You spray it and it comes oh, out with oh. water. And I used just stencils. A lot of them, um, like these, I just used like a um, um, masking tape. Because it doesn't leave residue. you put that in the frame also, the small one? Um, you put this I put them in a little hoop That's thing. Little, yeah, yeah, because I have little um, PVC pipe one that I do oh, the yeah, little ones yeah. in. Yeah. But the big ones, I also have a round hoop, and I put them in a lot of times in the round hoop because then I can sit it on my lap and I can move my leg. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, and I can turn it and mm -hmm. stuff instead of. Mm -hmm. But my chair's on wheels, so if I'm in the yeah. um, frame, I can wheel myself. Down. <laughs> 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 I, I wheel myself back and forth, so. <laughs> So, so there's no drag, and I just so your push husband my... is a quilt widow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I'm upstairs for too many days, he goes, "I hear your sewing room calling you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they know that's my woman cave. So you know, if he comes downstairs and oh my gosh, I go, "Hey, my woman cave, go back upstairs and leave my woman cave alone." So where did you say you work? Where did you say you work? I work at I work at Needle and Thread in Valparaiso. Needle and Thread. Yeah, it's a quilt mm -hmm. shop. It's cute. Yeah. And that so very cool. Yeah. Yeah, they have all kinds of family mm -hmm. without it, was there the any one. historical mm -hmm. anything written historically about uh, how many quilts a young woman should have before she gets married? Most of the time it was thirteen. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, that's why before 13. they were married. That's what I had heard. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was, was, yeah, was the deposit that. that she would have made herself. She would have made herself, and then they all would have got together when she got engaged and pulled them all up. Yeah, that was a, for her yeah. own chest. Yeah, for her own chest. Yeah. I don't know. That would be. But the kids nowadays are in trouble. My daughter's like, you know. <laughs> There's an Indian death ceremony that. Requires quilting before uh, a year after the death. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. They also like um, used quilts, like uh, like I said, they went out west and stuff. Um, like they, of course, there's a lot of deaths on the trail. Um, a lot of them were buried wrapped in quilts. Mm -hmm. And then um, one of our one of our we had a, a navy dog, that a retired navy dog. My son had brought home when he got out of the navy. And he had been in Iraq four year, four four tours, and he was a bomb sniffy dog, and he died last year. Oh and because um, he was ten years old, and you know he was one of the hardest working dogs they said they had, and 
when he died, we buried him in the backyard, and I put a, I put a quilt in there with them because it's like, I gotta, you know, it's like he's gotta have something to go with him, you know. And you, you know he deserved a hero, you know, and stuff. So it went with them and that. So a lot, like I said, they, they were buried with their quilts when they went out out west when they died and stuff. Um, she wanted to hear what she said. Somebody didn't hear what she said about the. A year after an Indian dies out west, um, they have a special ceremony, and the oldest daughter provides a big feast, and they make quilts for all of the people that have attended the funeral. Hmm. And uh, it's a ceremony, and it has to be done a year after the death. And they still do that. I mean, it's been going on. And what do they do with the quilts? Do they they do give them out to the family members. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's, these are on the reservations. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. One, one other question. Mm -hmm. When people years ago, we didn't have the plastic stuff to cut out the quilt block to draw around, so it seemed like every time you draw it, you kept saying, mark them with your pencil, cut them with the scissors, mm -hmm. your blocks shrunk. <coughs> and they wouldn't all be the same size by the time you got done. Yeah. When Scotch tape came out, my mom had the good idea to put Scotch tape around all of the quilt blocks. And you know, we never had that. So they table. wouldn't, yeah. So ah. they, they, didn't, they didn't shrink, they didn't get perfect. <laughs> and you know, so there's just a lot of, a lot oh, of yes. things that I remember about starting quilt, which I didn't even know was important until I hear people talking about right. it now. Yeah, I, my grandmother yeah. had the cardboard templates, uh, cereal yeah. boxes. That's right, the, yeah. the, the, the shredded wheat, <laughs> shredded yeah. wheat had a cardboard about this wide. And about that long. Yeah. And you cut that in three, and that made three squares. Yeah. Actually, um, April, I'm going to teach two hand piecing classes at the Hebron Library. Oh, and I'm going to teach them the first hour, it's two hour classes, and the first hour they're going to learn how to make templates out of cardboard boxes. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so, you know, if, if you're friends with anybody that works in an x ray department or, oh, or yeah. a place like that, those old x ray sheets. Are the best thing to draw your quilt box on and cut out. Yeah, you can get twenty or thirty for customer. Off of just one just of those. One of those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the customer I think comes in. She that's what she was using. Yeah. 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 So I heard the doctors that. don't like to give them to people. Yeah, because they're not to tell everybody. So don't tell them. I won't. I won't. Your secret's safe, right? Everybody else looks like you're in the hospital. I have to do that. You pay for it. 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 Any more questions? Okay. Good job. Very